um, the idea that there were certain mm, rules for conduct within war, so you could not um, attack uh, civilians or non-combatants, you couldn't destroy infrastructure, you couldn't use mass methods of, um, of killing um, that would be then indiscriminate, um, and so forth. But um, the interesting thing is that in the modern period there actually have been um, a number of thinkers who have argued for what we would recognize as a pacifist or nonviolent um, ethics of, uh, of conflict resolution. Um, so here are some names that you may or may not be familiar with, um, and uh, some of them are still alive. So the first is a man by the name of Maulana Wahiduddin Khan, who is in the Indian subcontinent. Um, he is alive today and very, 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 very old. You can watch him on YouTube because he is from the time period when Indians received excellent British education. Um, and he has a number of publications that are available full, full text. And his, um, he holds to a thoroughgoing pacifist um, line. He argues it from the Quran and from the life of the prophet and um, is very critical of the Islamic, the classical Islamic tradition and says that Muslims uh, went, you know, were, went way off the track in reading the Quran in, in a way that justifies or assumes the ever presence of, of, uh, of war, the way that I just described earlier. Um, and one of the critical things that he does is to um, decouple justice from peace. So as we, so, I mean, the, the idea of just war in a sense is that, um, that justice is a precondition for peace. One of the central tenets of pacifism is that peace uh, is, or nonviolence is a value in its own right and one should not wait for the conditions of justice to be met in order to um, take up a pacifist approach. So he, he's one person that's worth knowing about. Another famous figure is Ghaffar Badshah Khan, who was a colleague of Mahatma Gandhi's and um, is now passed away, although he did live for 98 years. Um, all of these pacifists live a long time. Um, so he um, was known as the frontier Gandhi and he argued for um, a, a complete nonviolent approach as well. Um, then we have Mahmoud Muhammad Taha, who was Sudanese, another very important figure um, who was ultimately put to death um, by the Sudanese government when they took their turn towards Islamism. And his argument was also based on the Quran, and he follows an interesting hermeneutics where he says that um, the classical tradition has chosen to give primacy to the later verses of the Quran. Um, but actually, the more universal ethics of, of Islam are embodied in the earlier verses of the Quran. So he actually uses the Quran and a particular method of exegesis to argue both for, um, n for nonviolence as well as the equal rights of non-Muslims within a Muslim state and for women. Um, and then we have Jodat Said in Syria, who is still alive today. He also, you can read his texts online and probably catch him on YouTube, although he'd be speaking in Arabic. Um, Ali Abdul Razik is a figure from Egypt, and Mahmoud Shaltout is another Egyptian as well. And these are people who argued that jihad is, was never a part of the fundamental message of Islam, and that in the modern day, where we are, where Muslims are permitted to spread the message of Islam through nonviolent means using methods of communication and where secular states permit people to practice their religion freely, there really is no justification for military struggle if, and in fact, that um, the message of Islam is more effectively spread or preached through nonviolent means. So even at a strategic level, violence is um, no longer legitimate. All of these people, some of these people would hold to, um, actually I should modify that, because they would allow for self-defense, but it's a very, very strict, restrictive, um, it's, it's not quite lambs to the slaughter, but it's, it's as close as you can get and still keep yourself alive. 
Yes, as I mentioned, Christianity was born as a pacifist religion, and it has always been a central part of our faith commitment. The distinction between killing and murdering is a very important distinction. And uh, pacifists within the Christian tradition have argued both ways. I mean, murder clearly is wrong, and then they have also argued killing is wrong, I mean, murdering is always wrong, and killing as well is wrong. From this pacifist perspective, there are, there are many values by which I can allow myself, or I could give my life to. I could do that. There are many things that are worthwhile my sacrifice of giving my life, but there is no value by which I can take somebody else's life. And that's kind of the pacifist uh, motto. That's kind of the sense they argue for. I could die for many causes, but I could not kill for any of them. Uh, the pacifist tradition has two sides to it, and the Christian tradition has two sides to it. One of it is, one of it is a kind of legalistic tradition. This is a command of God. This is a way of being. This is, this, this is almost what Jesus talked to us about in the Beatitudes, and therefore we don't violate it. And early Christians, we are told, did not join the police force and they did not join the army because there were practices that they could not fulfill. Now, there is another type of pacifism, which is not so much legalistic, but it is this sense of experience that I've been grasped by God's kingdom in such a way today that as I live my life today, I have to witness to that kingdom. And that kingdom is defined by the Prince of Peace and therefore violence is not a, a legitimate way of living out. So it is a kind of transformative way of being. The way Christians have dealt with this practically has been some of them have created communities that separate themselves from mainland communities. They have their own countercultural way of being, and they live internally, consistently internally, with minimum contact with outside world and minimum influence from outside world. Other pacifists have said, no, we will abide by the nonviolence way, but we will commit ourselves to justice agendas within the world. We will be kind of what Howard was would call, we will be kind of political naggers. We will be out there complaining and criticizing and showing everything that's going well. We will never do it violently, but we will be highly committed to justice, even if it's costly to us. And, we, and, we, and basically, we do so because this is the way that we experience God's kingdom among us, and this is the way we live. This has been a constant in the Christian tradition. The dominant view in the Christian tradition has been the just war theory, in which self-defense, defense of nature, defense of value is a legitimate way of, of exercising violence. But the pacifists have grown in influence within all, within all denominations, particularly because they have witnessed a practical commitment to justice that many just war churches do not exemplify as well. Uh, Rabbi Komorowski, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I'd say there, there certainly is a, uh, is a, a movement of, 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 for pacifism within Judaism or movements most prominent of which was founded in part by Rabbi Kronbach, whom I mentioned. Uh, it's called the Jewish Peace, Fellow Peace Fellowship, which is still active today. Uh, and the, perhaps ironically, perhaps not, the, uh, the nexus of Jewish peace movements in the, in the world is in the state of Israel. Uh, that there are many who, uh, who some would say are, are, go are willing to negotiate themselves to death others would say are, are overly optimistic, and some would say they're, they're the only and the last best hope for, for peace in the Middle East. I leave it to all, to all of you to, uh, to decide. When I have my, main, my mind made up, I'll let you know that as well. Uh, but I would like one final comment about Jewish pacifism, that I believe firmly that it was a Jewish pacifism